Testing, testing, Raji Chataba, Raji Chataba. Hi, I'm Sapi Knight. Uh, I have a bachelor's in geography and sociology. And in particular for this video, I'm interested in mythology and astrology and where their archetypes align and relate to humanity and humanities. I'm also a co-creator of uh, Studio Pandemonia, like a small business shop, mostly on Etsy. Um, we publish our own uh, kind of Oracle Tarot decks and other merchandise, like basically trying to create our own little IP. So we have a Gift of Virtue um, right here, um, 144 virtues from around the world. Um, I'm coming out with one, this is just a prototype, a guide deck about astrology. I come to astrology myself from not only a perspective of, um, I guess, effectively a pagan, but also from a secular schol scholarly kind of perspective, an academic one. I'm also working on a pantheon that takes in uh, deities from around the world and kind of using the framework of astrology turning all those archetypes into particular personalities and particular characters. Um, only recently have I been able to try to make it, uh, let's say, more practical, uh, <laughs> say with decks, uh, things that are actual material products. Otherwise, you know, I would just play around in spreadsheets all day, and I still do. And so I'm starting with the Greek gods uh, because they're pretty mainstream. And there's a lot of other videos out there that I've seen that are trying to correlate astrology and mythology. And they usually use the Greeks at least first. So I'm going to start there first. And there are corrections I would have made to a lot of videos I've seen. There's really two parts to what I'm doing. There's what's not my opinion, which is, say, for instance... Zodiacs are already associated with certain planets. And those planets are already associated with certain deities. So to some extent, not all, but a lot of the deities can already kind of be um, assumed to be uh, related to certain signs. And that's another reason why I didn't want this video to simply be a list of the relationships. I wanted to actually go into and explain why those associations are there. The other part that is part of my opinion is it's by opinion I don't mean that it's you know not backed up by evidence. Sometimes the subjective is intersubjective. It's something that an individual, a family, a culture, an entire species or all of life have some commonality of some kind. I'm basing my opinion on maybe other opinions, you know, <laughs> what else can anyone do really? A lot of the decisions and the connections I'll be making are based on artistic interpretations of particular deities or of particular signs. Because my ultimate aim is to create a global pantheon, I'm not necessarily as interested in making sure every single deity and every single mythology is completely distinct from every other. So I will make distinctions, and you'll see it's kind of interesting how astrology requires you to make distinctions between different deities and to be like, you know what, this isn't quite in line with this archetype. It's a little closer to that one. I'm going to be coming at this with the perspective of syncretism, which means basically trying to syncretize all these mythologies into uh, one mythology. <laughs> and that's quite the baggage to come in with, and I recognize that. But I'm putting it forward that that's where I'm coming from. I'm going to try to <laughs> hit that balance as much as I possibly can. But again, I could be super rigid, and if I was very many of these deities on this list would not be placed at all. I would just be like, well, they're a little bit of this, a little bit of this, can't make a decision. And there's at least one in this one, actually, you'll see that I don't yet have the ability to place perfectly. Um, and a lot of them are not perfectly placed. 
I think part of it is just fun. It's just fun to see where they might fit. Let's get to the tier list. Well, I was prepared to do an entire presentation, like a PowerPoint thing going on, but <laughs> I thought, you know, maybe that's not the best format or not the most fun way of doing this. Maybe the most fun way of doing it would be something like a tier list. At first I was like, oh, I'll just do 12 Olympian gods. Yeah. And, uh, and then I wanted to do the 12 Titans. And then there was a few thrown in that I'm like, well, I have to mention these. Maybe I'll cut this video into like two parts or something and treat them somewhat separately. Um, maybe between the Titans and Olympians, but for now, I guess I will just uh, go with it. Got a tier list, got a presentation. Let's do this thing. Part one, the Olympian gods. Now, typically it's said that these are 12 gods, but I'm going to say 14. <laughs> so I have all the 12, 14 Olympian gods on the top row here. Um, we got Zeus, Hera, Demeter, Hades, Poseidon, Hestia, Ares, Athena, Hermes, Artemis, Apollo, Aphrodite, Hephaestus, Dionysus. That's basically the 14. Often Dionysus or Hestia are changed out um, or not included. This is part of the reason that I want to do more of a presentation on this rather than simply going and making video of just like, this is this, this is this. Um, because it's not that simple. Um, it's not always that simple. Some of them are quite simple, and we can maybe start with the simpler ones. But as we go through them, it'll get more complicated. You'll see why. And it's not necessarily interesting just to shoehorn them into one sign or another. There's sometimes multiple aspects to deities. And deities themselves have evolved from other deities, from other myth mythologies and pantheons throughout time. Or even from people who are you humorized, which just means pretty much they, they become divine over time. Um, they might have just been famous kings or queens. There is also a lot of Roman that's going to be included with this. I think looking at the Roman, and I will be naming them and putting the names of the Romans next to the names of the Greeks throughout the entire thing, just to, you know, draw some parallels. Um, the Romans are particularly useful because a lot of their deities are named after actual planets themselves. Since zodiacs are associated with certain planets, it's very easy then to associate the god with that planet. But there's some deities that aren't explicit, and, you know, a lot of this is quite speculative because it's not like there is a truth and they actually are this or that. This is somewhat of a subjective thing, but Nonetheless, there's some decisions we can make, and I think the interesting thing here is why we make those decisions, and maybe how we could change our decisions over time. I said we would start easy. Um, probably the easiest one to start with is Aries. Can you guess which one of these is Aries? Yes, Aries. Uh, <laughs> let me put him up. Here he is, Aries. The Aries constellation itself actually comes from Chris O'Malos who's the golden ram, the ram whose hide eventually becomes the golden fleece. And his um, hide actually were ke kept in the Garden of, of Ares over in Colchis, which is in modern Georgia, um, the nation of Georgia, not the state in the United States. Obviously, in the Roman pantheon, his name is Mars. And again, keeping in with my reasoning for bringing up Roman here is Roman and Greek are often conflated together. The issue is they're not completely the same. Um, I, In all my research, I found that there are some deities, and we will get to them, that are actually a little more complicated in Roman than they are in Greek, and other ones that are more complicated in Greek than Roman. Uh, that there's something else, some other aspects going on. A particular deity might transform or evolve or diverge into different personas. These different personas then identifying with different zodiac signs or profiles or themes or archetypes. 
right? When it comes to Mars and Aries, it's one of those that's actually quite firm and quite clear. And Mars, of course, is associated with the planet Mars, uh, the red planet. And Mars is thus associated with um, war and passion and wrath and courage and emotion. So these are all traits of Aries. Now next we have Hermes. Now I've got a bias here um, because I am the sign that Hermes is, um, but there's reasons. There's reasons for that. Not just his relation to the sign that I identify with, but because of the motifs that he adds to it. So this is something I found interesting in my research is sometimes it doesn't just go one way where it's like of oh, all these characteristics of a particular sign I go look at a god or and I say oh well this god identifies with these characteristics rather I often um, find more depth in astrology when applying different deities from different pantheons I'm able to see the nuance of a character now the Roman term for Hermes is Mercurius, uh, Mercury, the planet Mercury. And Mercury is associated indeed with Gemini. Now, Gemini is a sign of communication. I'd like to mention quickly about the art I'm using for this. This isn't my art, of course. Um, this is art from my Pinterest. I linked it in the description. Sometimes I use the art as at least one level of correlation not just art that's like professionally grounded in research but art like this for instance that is actually i believe from magic the gathering which just shows the vibe of hermes i often don't find art for hermes that is really dignant or that feels to me to really represent um the themes uh, of Hermes. A lot of it's very external, like say, it basically just like Quicksilver or um, The Flash or something. It's just basically a super fast guy who flies around. The theme is not superheroes. The theme is archetypes, uh, metaphors for what people are like or what, what, what humans can be. The archetype of the messenger god is Hermes, right? And Mercury as a planet is basically the messenger of the sun, the closest planet to the sun, most loyal to the sun, and it moves quickly around the sun. These are all reasons for why archetypally Mercury, the god, Hermes, the god, became associated with quickness and uh, as a messenger and travel and commerce, and even thought, since thought is so quick and so changeable. I need to get better at doing these transitions a little sooner. Um, I got kind of an extensive setup here. I always overdo it. <laughs> but this is a first, I guess, attempt to see how to do this right. The next deity is Artemis. Artemis, Diana as well, in Roman, and also Roman, um, another term for her is Iana or Jana, is a goddess of the moon. Her motif is actually shared in many mythologies, or I place her appropriately in Cancer. This is another one of those that is actually quite universally understood. Um, it's not often that somebody doesn't associate Artemis and Diana with, with Cancer and with the moon. And that's good. The motif is very strong and clear there. Not everybody knows the nature of the planet Mercury. You know, um, I think a lot of people understand Mars. Mars has its own archetypes within our cultures. Um, Martians and Mars is often associated with war and conflict. And the red planet has a certain aggressive uh, quality to it, right? The moon, likewise, has very reflective and emotional and almost ethereal qualities to it, which are shared by the characteristics of Cancer. Now, Artemis's brother, Apollo, 
or in Roman, actually, the word is Phoebus. A lot of people don't know that, but Phoebus, which kind of just means light, as it implies his association is heavy with the sun. And this is not just, you know, on his own merit. The very idea of him being the twin brother of Artemis, of them being twins, is the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon are often twins. They're often opposites in some sort of mythological sense. And so there's really nothing anywhere which would indicate that, <laughs> that Apollo is not a Leo. Um, Leo is associated with the sun. Light is associated with the sun. The idea of truth is often associated with the sun. The sun is also a benefactor. It gives life and warmth and light to the world. Apollo likewise represents a certain, almost like enlightenment. Um, he's often depicted as an enlightening god. And he's also a god of friendship and of bonds, close bonds. Once again, I forget to transition. <laughs> Maybe I'll figure it out at some point. Next we have Demeter. Now Demeter is a goddess of agriculture, farming, and the harvest. Like she is actually older than uh, a lot of the other gods in the Olympian pantheon. Uh, and we'll get into that when I think I talk about the Titans and her particular relationship with her mother, Rhea. It kind of helps to look at the Roman counterpart, Ceres. Ceres is actually a planet in the asteroid belt, a dwarf planet, that is. Now, the asteroid belt I'm referring to is between uh, Mars and Jupiter, so it's almost an inner planet and basically represents the entire asteroid field. The association of Ceres is with Virgo. Now, Virgo is actually the sign uh, most associated with agriculture uh, and with the harvest. Even the very constellation of Virgo, if you look at it, as you can see in this picture, she has a bushel of wheat, of grains. That bushel is actually, I believe, Coma Berenices, that she's basically holding. In general, she's a goddess of the harvest. And she basically represents the first farmer uh, of the Neolithic. And that, that would be the period uh, when farming was first developed. At least the Neolithic of Europe and the Middle East is what she's referred to. For now, Virgo is quite clear. Next we have Hades, another quite simple one that we can just conflate with Pluto. Now, Pluto... And if anyone knows astrology, it doesn't take much to guess. Hmm, I went into which sign. Uh, uh, Scorpio. Yes. Pluto, the planet, is associated with Scorpio. And Hades, very much so, is associated with the aspects of Scorpio as a death god and a god of the underworld and a god of darkness. Definitely Scorpio. Next we have Poseidon. Another actually quite easy one. Neptune is associated quite simply with Pisces. And Poseidon, I mean even the name sounds like Pisces. And he is a god of fishing and seafaring. I mean it's quite clear really um, Pisces connotation. He's a little different from a titan that we'll get into um, later, uh, which is more of a natural ocean sea god, right? Poseidon actually represents humans at sea. He's more of a protector of humanity, um, at least to some degree, and might have actually stemmed from the uh, kind of demigod Glaucus, who was kind of like Davy Jones in some ways. He was basically a fisherman that fell in love with the sea and became a god, um, and then used his godly powers to protect seafarers. So it was very interesting. In that sense, even 
the aspects of Pisces as people who tend to be quite supportive and helpful and compassionate is an aspect of Poseidon that could be leaned into. But yes, Pisces. Next, we've got Zeus. This is another one that gets kind of confused at times. Um, I've seen one where Zeus was associated with Leo. And I see what they're saying because Leo is connotated with being a leader or being a king. Besides that not being a very healthy thing to tell people, <laughs> or not being a very really deep or interesting aspect in mythology, you know, being king is not actually the deepest thing ever. Um, and it's understandable why Leo was associated with that, or at least lions maybe are associated with that. But Zeus is actually not even often associated with a lion. There's usually other deities or other animals or zodiacs, so to speak, like an eagle that he's associated with or even a bull. When we look at the Roman counterpart, um, Jupiter or Jove is his other name, we are very squarely faced with the fact that he is a Sagittarius or at least has Sagittarian qualities. Jupiter, the planet, is itself kind of a storm planet. Zeus is often portrayed kind of wandering, kind of adventuring out. He's not always sitting up on his throne, and he's not particularly intellectual in the way he does things. He's kind of just a her heroic kind of dude. Um, sometimes not as heroic. I mean, often not as heroic, if we're being honest. But um, he's definitely very Sagittarius in the way he does things. It makes perfect sense to me. I'm putting that thing before I even throw this up there. Boom, there we go. See that? Yeah. There's so many different uh, monitors I have to I have to monitor when I'm doing this. But uh, we're starting to get to the to the harder ones. Um Zeus's partner, Hera. Um or in Rome and Roman is Juno, might actually re relate to the Greek goddess Eunomia, who is a goddess basically of like good order. It's not Harmonia, which is a goddess that I don't have in this lineup, but maybe one day um, in some other listing we can have her, but harmony in the kind of social sense. She seems to represent organization of the state. Now that might stem from her relationship to the Hore, or the Hours, basically. And Hour, in the sense of what Greeks mean, is the different periods of time, not always just hours in a day. It relates to the calendars and celebrations and festivals. Um, these ways that the year is organized around. Um, so Hera really represents kind of the unity of the family and the state and the nation and the society. Um, and Juno as well, her name somewhat relates to unity. This makes it actually quite difficult to place her. There are aspects of a kind of civilizing deity, um, of kind of harmony and goodness and... Um, and fortune, for instance, like Fortuna, that kind of go under what we might call a Capricorn quality. There are aspects also that fall under a Libra, that sort of organization and justice um, mindset. And there are aspects also that go into Taurus in the home and hearth, and well, not the hearth, but the home and organization of the family and these types of things. And there's also aspects of Gemini, Juno itself, is related to June, which is mostly when Gemini takes place in. Eunomia and Juno both represent kind of unity and social structure, which is almost like another aspect of, say, Hermes um, as a messenger god, as a god of communication. There might be a goddess of communication, a goddess of mediation, a goddess of social structure. There's a lot of places that Hera can go, I think. But what I tend to look at, at least when we're looking at Greek, um, we're talking about organizing festivals and 
and the home and the nation. Uh, I think I would put her in Taurus. Some of it comes down to, you can even see in this magic gathering picture here, it comes down to the bull connotations. Now those bull connotations could also just be due to the fact that a lot of storm deities, like her partner Zeus, are associated with bulls, despite the fact that bulls are associated mostly with Taurus and not, say, with Sagittarius at all. When I think archaeologically, I think of her as relating to kind of the Bronze Age, the unifying civilizations. Now there's a case to be made that maybe the Roman counterpart, and if I did a Roman version of this video, I might place her in Gemini or something else. At least in the Greek aspect, I think I'm going to put her in, in Taurus and see, see where that gets us. Next we have Aphrodite. Now Hera is pretty hard. Aphrodite is actually easier than one might think, um, but also complicated. The truth of it is, is Aphrodite is equated with Venus in the Roman pantheon, and all of them relate to the original Titan Eos. Now I put her in here because they all have the same archetype, despite the fact that they're not all the same deity. Um, but Eos is the goddess of dawn and Venus, you know, the morning star and the evening star. Aphrodite is very much associated with Libra, very directly. So that is a given, or should be a given. The difficulty is there are a lot of aspects of Aphrodite, I mean, you could even see in the imagery here, that are associated with the ocean. At least she was born of the ocean, since she was born from Uranus, and maybe some ambiguous sea goddess. It could be Thalassa, or um, someone else, or Quito, or something. The Pisces constellation itself is considered to be made up of two fish. One of the fish is said to be Aphrodite, the other one is said to be Eros, her daughter, her son, sorry. Um, and Eros also is basically a, a male counterpart to, to Eos, in a sense, at least in terms of the word. So, like, he might have actually evolved from an older deity, maybe Phosphorus. E Eos, Phos Eos Phorus, I think is his name. But basically, Aphrodite being related to Pisces in some way is also a, a big option. Now, part of what makes it a little easier for us in making this decision and then for me saying, okay, well, she belongs in Libra, is because Aphrodite evolved from an older deity, a, a deity from perhaps another culture, or perhaps the original Neolithic culture that the Greeks were before other outside influences came in. And that would be the uh, Phoenician deity, Astarte. And Astarte, evolved from Ishtar and Inanna of the Sumerian and later Babylonian and, you know, later Semitic mythologies. Astarte and Ishtar and Inanna are all associated with Venus and all associated in that sense with Libra. And they all represent the selective forces, um, particularly the feminine selective sources, which used to be very strong in the Middle East. Um, in fact, the priestly class in Mesopotamia for a lot of the early periods was run by priestesses of Ishtar. And they basically selected kings and decided which ones were worthy and which ones weren't, and would pretty much be reigning in uh, the, the order of the state. Now, Ishtar and Inanna were also associated with war and sex. And so selection was a very big topic. Femininity had a certain power to it um, that was respected and understood. And Ishtar really represented that. The Greeks, however, have done something a little strange um, with Aphrodite. They basically removed all of the warrior aspects and turned her into 
everything that the Greeks thought were feminine, right? When we look back to the Phoenicians, Astarte still had those militaristic aspects, implying maybe the Phoenicians were a little less misogynistic than the Greeks. But the Greeks, alas, still saved a part of that warrior aspect. Or maybe two parts, I will argue here, of that warrior aspect. And that would be Athena. Basically, she's all of the aspects of Aphrodite that were kind of severed by the Greeks from the original source. And so it's almost a split personality going on. Athena was said to be, you know, born of the mind of Zeus. This, I will show you in another persona that we'll bring up later with the Titans, is not exactly, I don't think, true. I think that might have been a later account. Again, somewhat more misogynistic account. But essentially, Athena retains the other qualities of Libra, which is the strategic thinking and the, the wisdom of rulership, basically. Now, that does make Athena synonymous with Libra, but another aspect of Athena is actually quite Aries, basically a counterpart. They're often treated as opposing one another because one is more strategic, one is more, I guess, wrathful and aggressive. Now, Ishtar, Astarte, etc., is not always considered to be the strategic ruler or the strategic leader or the strategic warrior you know not necessarily always the thoughtful one often she had an aspect that was extremely violent and wrathful um, when it needed to be basically there were three aspects of ishtar there's the warrior there's the priestess i suppose and then there's the sort of selection power the pure feminine um ideal you know so these three personas were split in greek and partially in roman as we see minerva here although minerva might have had some older separate influence maybe from the etruscans so that i don't have to consider putting athena in aries because i think athena is a lot more kind of thoughtful and more of an air sign um, more airy in her her aspects than than an Aries would be. I actually place another persona here uh, of Ishtar and of Aphrodite and of Athena, which is Enyo or Bellona. Her Roman name is also Roma, although that is a very obscure goddess and hasn't tended to be um, a very popular name for her. But she might have actually been the original uh, titular goddess of the Romans. And uh, might have even been associated with the wolf that raised Romulus and Remus. Um, there's some metaphor there with another potential deity of the Etruscans, Ruma, which relates to, I guess, Ruminids. It relates to basically a cow. And since, you know, Romulus and Remus are portrayed drinking the milk of a wild wolf, she-wolf. Um, there might have been an older version of that story where they were uh, twin deities of a cow goddess, which would have been more in line, I say, with Taurus. Um, but the way that she evolved uh, over time here, Bellona, for instance, literally stems from, again, Phoenician. Bellona really basically means Ball's wife or partner, whatever, have it. Um, Ball was the thunder god of the Phoenicians and the Canaanites. And uh, the Carthaginians also. Ball Hamon was like an evolved and somewhat conflated version of him. He takes basically a version of Ishtar as his wife. Um, Bologna or Balit is another name for Astarte, Ishtar, um, that whole deity. So it's another confirmation that they're the same. 
and that they're related. Another term for her was enyo, and that's probably the main term, and it is shared in Greek, and might relate to some Greek and Minoan, uh, the Greek and Minoan male counterpart to her, which was Enyalios, who somewhat relates to the, I think it was the Minoan deity Enuarijo, who was the god of war and is basically synonymous with Ares. So, long story short, all of these, in combination with the Roman relationship, um, since Romans consider Mars to be their primary deity, show that this goddess was probably identified with Ares. Or she was probably the Ares aspect of Aphrodite and Athena. Now, her persona is much more popular, I think, in Roman than it was in Greek. But, you know, the Greeks had Athena and they felt like they got what they needed with that archetype. But there really is more to this. Enyo was particularly more wrathful. And she more relates to destruction. So she's like that aspect of Ishtar I talked about, which gave wrath when it needed be. In the Hindu pantheon, the goddess Kali kind of has a, her main form is basically this. It's this wrathful selection force of this justice, which is a very Libra aspect, becomes kind of wrathful and destructive in its Aries component. And there is a relationship between Libra and Aries. They're both cardinal signs. We call it power signs, because um, there's wisdom, power, and love. So there's a reason that power is so important to Aphrodite and Ishtar, and this whole deity of many names. Um, power seems to be the, the key word there. And then another, another note... Um, with the name Roma, although Mars is the main god of the Romans, the, the Etruscan goddess Apru is based on Aphrodite and is the namesake of the month of April, which again, all the months are made by Romans. And April is actually the month of the founding of Rome. And I have an interesting hypothesis that maybe the original um, patron god of Rome was Roma was Enyo, was Aphrodite, not the male Mars or Ares. Sorry. Moving on. Uh, we got her face just. So now we've gotten to the end of a lot of the really um, easy to quantify ones, ones that you could really correlate with planets. In the Titan section, there are, as you can see, Capricorn and Aquarius, a few planets that are not, we haven't, we haven't touched on yet. But with Hephaestus and Vulcan, the Roman counterpart, he's a god of smithing, and he's associated with volcanoes. Um, he's a god of crafts and creation. And he's another deity that probably goes back further than Greek culture. He probably goes back to older Minoan and Neolithic uh, remnants. It's part of why he's not really explicitly shown. He's not a son of Kronos, for instance, like some of these other ones I mentioned. And he's not really seemingly included. He's said to be the son of Hera, but the son of Hera before Zeus, when he's misshapen. And he seems to have been kind of left out, almost like the Spartans leave out babies, you know, just left out by Hera, like, uh, you're not worthy. I have a running theory in my mind that he is the stone that, that Rhea gives Kronos uh, so that he would eat the stone instead of Zeus. So he's almost something of a, um, I guess, a scapegoat or a sacrifice. But, like, uh, the stone itself was regurgitated, but gestated <laughs> within him became Hephaestus. I have that running theory. I don't think there's any evidence in the record for that theory, but like, um, not really theory or that idea, that thought, that kind of artistic flair that I have, but I think that would be really interesting and cool. I would say the easiest guess for me on this is Capricorn, since he is a god of creation and of crafts, uh, and of metals and, uh, you know, ores and things. Capricorn basically is the most chthonic sign, 
apart from Scorpio. It's the most associated with mountains. Um, I haven't mentioned yet, in my system, we have cusps. We have cusp signs. And so I'll maybe do a video at some point where we actually show the cusp signs. But Hephaestus in particular is a cusp. I'm in the right area as the cusp. But basically, it's hard to make Hephaestus a pure Capricorn because he's very associated with not just mountains and earth and ground, but with metal and fire and the forge. And these are all elements which kind of, they're like compound elements. They, it transcends the simple four element system. You could say fire, right? But it's too earthy for fire. You can't just say earth, it's too fiery for earth. So I place them in the, in the cusp between Sagittarius and Capricorn. I'll tell you that much. For now, it's fine to put them within Capricorn. That makes sense to me. With Hestia, this is another complicated one. I also put her within a cusp, but uh, without affording myself that right. <laughs> now, Hestia is a goddess of the home and hearth. A few people have placed her within Taurus because of the home relationship. Taurus is our homey, or um, they relate to the family and such. But again, fire. You could associate her, maybe, if you wanted, with the cusp between Aries and Taurus. That's possible. But in the research I'd done, that I can't yet tell you, because I would need a whole video for that, um, that is not exactly the archetype of the, the fire holder, which is actually a very common um, archetype throughout many mythologies. Pele of the... Hawaiian mythology. She has earthy aspects like a Gaia or a Taurus would, but also fiery aspects that, say, an Aries or a Sagittarius or a Leo would have. Now, Sagittarius, I don't think would be very strong for this. Apart from Sagittarius being associated with more with lightning, it's also not homey, let's say. <laughs> very adventurous and out there. Um, I often associate Sagittarius with more horsemanship and the sort. So we have ourselves more close to Leo, perhaps. What around Leo is relevant? Well, probably not Cancer, since uh, Cancer is, you know, related to the moon and sure to family, but mostly to the kind of emotional and deep intuitive connection to those things. Estia has a little more to do with kind of the practical. And that, again, that makes her seem kind of taurus -y, but it also makes her kind of Libra, or Virgo, sorry. As Virgo has to do with agriculture and aspects of civilization, Hestia and Vesta, the Roman counterpart, have really to do with the internal systems of civilization, or even of just settling in general, settlements. And so I honestly place her in the cusp between Leo and Virgo. I think Leo is much more consistent with the kind of fire that is held in the home, the kind of fire that warms the home, that's a giving fire, kind of metaphorical of the sun itself. Now, I don't put her squarely into Leo um, ultimately because I have the cusp that allow more nuance, but also because there's other female solar deities out there, like Solana, like Sunna, who are actually very aggressively Leo and are represented by the sun itself. And I feel like, especially when I factor in a few other deities that are kind of like Hestia, like Bridget of um, Celtic mythology, then she tends to have a little more of a Virgo aspect. And when you put it all together, it starts to make sense. For now, I'll put it inside Leo. There's there's enough going on there that I think that's that's an appropriate decision. Uh, did I skip something? Okay. <laughs> Here we got Dionysus. This one's another very difficult one. Dionysus is basically a Greek deity that was adopted now, the Orph 
Orphic tradition or the Orphic people are related to Phrygians, Thracians, and Dacians, which were from basically north of Greece. And they spread down into Greece and into the Anatolia and spread a lot of their practices and their mythology there. Bacchus in particular was actually a historical person, something of a cult leader who uh, traveled on boat and spread his prophecies and his, his, his way of living, living freely and wandering freely. The Dionysian cult and the Bacchic cult were all about kind of living life to the fullest and embracing emotionality. Sometimes they were kind of mad, kind of crazy. When we are trying to relate it back to astrology in some way, it gets very difficult. You know, Dionysus as a term is related to the very same root word of Zeus, uh, Dion. It basically means day. Basically the sky deity, the sky father, is the original term deus that Zeus and Dionysus are related to. And so there's an argument to be made that Dionysus was kind of a later separate migration of the Zeus archetype into Greece and it took on some different aspects. Some of those aspects related to wine have some correlations in other mythologies that's actually quite interesting. For instance, people like Noah, um, who is also associated with wine, um, is clearly associated with the Great Flood. There's a deity in Greek, um, particularly of Thracian origin, uh, named Deucalion, who is very much the same, a survivor of a great deluge, who cultivated wine afterwards. There is a motif here of something, I would say, almost Piscean, in the sense that it's, it's oceanic. There's some other deities that also associate themselves with the ocean and seafaring and surviving a flood or being fishermen um, and coming to cultivate wine or coming to kind of live life to the fullest, so to speak, or to travel and wander the world. There's almost an aspect of Aquarius there with the wine being a cup bearing this sort of, I guess, awakened divine drink. There's an aspect of Capricorn in, in all of it, where he has some correlations with Osiris um, before he died, which was kind of a agricultural, uh, civil, civilizing deity who had a tragedy or was uh, died and then resurrected. Dionysus also died and was resurrected. There's all kinds of correlations here. You can look at Sagittarius with the wandering and the the traveling, the adventurous aspect of it, kind of living life to the fullest. You can look at it as Scorpio with kind of giving into those deep needs and desires and living living them out. This is one where I don't think like Hestia and Hephaestus, I just want to put it somewhere nice for you. I, I think he's very complicated and is going to take a lot to unravel and I think we need multiple mythologies to look at before we can like say okay what is the vibe here so I got a question mark don't worry this is the only one that's got a question mark next we got Pan we are now past all of the official 14 Olympians and we got a little bonus round here I think I got four maybe five little bonuses that we can go through here quick now Pan is a god of nature Faunus is the other the other roman and alternative names for him a fawn is a half goat half man type being as is displayed here um, pan is quintessentially defined that way there's other deities like sylvanus and uh, selenus who are also defined that way probably stemming from the same pannonian culture um, or Danubian culture, which is related to a lot of Celtic, Celtic cultures, uh, deities like Serenunos. There's a lot of connotations also with him in a Dionysus that's kind of interesting as well. <laughs> if I were to get as simple as possible, the goat is associated with Capricorn. 
Um, even if you look at the uh, Egyptian or Ptolemaic um, pantheon where uh, where Greek gods are kind of synthesized with Egyptian gods, we have Aegypan in one of the stories, who's basically the heroic Pan, who pretty much represents Osiris and defeats Typhon uh, rather than Zeus. Uh, he's actually the real hero of the story, and Zeus ran away along with all the other gods, and he was the only one that actually stood up against them. The wilderness, the unapologeticness, the groundedness of his nature, and the kind of mischievousness on top of all of it, it does fit within really what a Capricorn truly is. So I place it there. Next, Persephone, I wanted to include her. Um, Proserpina is her Roman kind of translation, but the Romans also call her uh, Cora and the Greeks Cora. Um, and it actually relates to Flora, another Roman goddess, a goddess of flowers, clearly. As a goddess of flowers, she also represents growth and the seasons. When she comes out of the underworld, she brings spring, and then when she goes back and descends back into the underworld with her partner Hades, it's winter. The whole story there relates her closely with her mother, Demeter. The relationship between Demeter and Persephone um, as mother and daughter is something where this the seasonal changes are not actually Persephone's doing, they're Demeter's doing. So when Persephone is there, Demeter is happy. Um, on the surface, and so the world grows and and blooms and is beautiful and there's good harvest and such. And then when she goes back and descends in the other world, Demeter grows sad and depressed, and so the world and the seasons change to become winter. Now there are aspects of Persephone that could be, you know, associated with Scorpio because Hades is a Scorpio, or could be associated with, I don't know, maybe Taurus, because the spring is associated with her. If she was associated more with Taurus, something more in the spring than in, um, say, Virgo in autumn, that would, that would make more sense with Flora, the goddess of flowers and of growth and basically of the spring. So honestly, it could go, she could go in Taurus, she could go in Virgo for the sake of kind of where I'm at. I'd say she's Virgo, or at least I'd put her in Virgo as part of that lineage of Demeter. Don't want to give too much away. Now, Chiron is super easy. Chiron literally is the Sagittarius constellation. Uh, he was basically given the constellation as a consolation for um, <laughs> for Hercules messing up his, his entire tribe of people, all the centaurs, basically. So basically, that's a given. But another really weird thing I wanted to mention about him is the Sagittarius constellation was not always associated with a centaur. We kind of automatically do now, but it's actually just meant to be an archer or a hunter, right? There's actually another constellation or more close to Virgo that's called Centaurus that is technically supposed to be a centaur. Now, I don't prefer to see it that way. I see it as a boar. Um, because there's some other um, astrologies and other cultures that see it that way. And I think that a boar is more in line with what would be near Virgo or something. And so I often, you know, basically conflate um, Centaurus with Sagittarius in my own mind. And a lot of people do these days. And I think it's fair to do that. I think the metaphor is, the symbology is quite clear. So I want to just include Chiron on here. And Hercules is another somewhat complicated one. Um, in terms of the constellation of his own name, it is actually near Sagittarius. It's just below Sagittarius and Ophiuchus. And the curious thing about Ophiuchus, despite it being a different constellation from Her Hercules, is as you can see in this imagery, Hercules literally wrestles a hydra in the same sense that Ophiuchus literally means a serpent handler, basically. And that kind of pushes him towards Sagittarius, or at least towards that cusp between Sagittarius and Scorpio. 
But there's also aspects of him with, you know, him taking on the persona of a lion and symbolically um, kind of relating to other lion deities, like in the Egyptian Onurus, I think, who's a lion-headed sort of deity of strength. Like Kratos is kind of similar, because Kratos is just a god of strength, basically, and Hercules is himself basically a demigod of strength. But he also resembles heroism. So there's some Leo in there potentially to some degree there's even a little Ares, but a warrior and a hero are, are different a warrior fights in wars a hero often fights monsters uh, maybe even their own monsters but i tend to say sagittarius um because i think the motif of strength and heroism is a little more related to kind of what zeus represents what zeus also represents his father the story of Hercules, especially this one particular one of Hy the, him fighting the Hydra, is basically a retread of the Zeus story of fighting the Typhon, the dragon. And that motif is in many older myths, like going back to Sumerians and so on, with like Tiamat and such. Of course, the myth of Zeus defeating Typhon is a myth that's meant to justify his rulership over the gods. The same thing happens with Marduk in the Babylonian mythology because he defeats Tiamat. This motif um, is not always good for people. <laughs> Sometimes it becomes, you know, uh, conquest oriented. That's, that's I think, the, the vibe of, of Sagittarius is heroic for the sake of others at their, at their best. That's what it should be. I have Zephyr in here. I thought I'd include him. I don't know what you might be thinking. Uh, is he going to go in Aquarius? No. Um, actually, God of the West Winds, the warm winds, the the loving breeze, the um, kind of loose and constantly changing, constantly traveling, you know, very mutable. Zephyr is very much in line with Gemini. And it's weird because Hermes is very much a wind god in a sense, but he's not explicitly a wind god. But since Zephyr is somewhat of an older god, I think, um, or maybe even a god, he might have been related to Boreas, and Boreas, I think, came from the Thracians as well. He might have actually come from a different pantheon entirely, but with a similar motif, a motif that might have actually been originally the same motif between Hermes and, and Zephyr. Sometimes I even relate him to Seth. Um, Egyptian Seth just because of the words just because I like you know twisting the myth a little bit to see what what depth you can get from it but um, for the sake of this I put him inside Gemini um, as a god of wind I think it needs to be emphasized that Gemini represents the winds and now that was part one uh, man, that took a little while. If you got this far, I congratulate you. I commend you for your curiosity and probably your patience. <laughs> you can like the video if you support me doing this kind of thing again. Um, I'm probably going to do it anyway, but it would really help, actually. You can also watch part two, The Titans, in order to learn a little bit more about some lesser known gods. I really like them. And you can subscribe for more from this new channel. There are a lot of projects that I have in the works. Before this video, I only have like music and maybe some gaming content a little bit. I will have more gaming content. I considered maybe making another YouTube channel uh, for Pandemonium, but it's coming from my heart, and it's coming from kind of who I am. And I've had this, I guess, persona, this online persona of Sabianite for a long time. <laughs> it, it means what, what I do, or what I'm interested in, who I am. So, Sabianite is alright. I'll be Sabianite. <laughs> I also linked my Pinterest collection that I used uh, in the art of this video, and a link to my shop. Uh, Studio Pandemonia. Why not? Thanks again for watching. Uh, I'll see you in the next one.